Good morning, everybody. Hi, welcome. This is like the first session, right? How exciting, all the energy in the room. Um, well, I am here, we are doing, whoa, I'm over there also. Um, we are doing this session on the uh, future, I don't even know the title actually, uh, the future of affordable housing. So we're gonna talk about community land trusts and co-ops and more. Um, so I'm first gonna have um, everybody introduce themselves and I'll start and then we'll go through and we're hoping to have a lot of time for questions as well. Um, so my name is Katie Ulrich. I am the Associate Director at Proud Ground, a community land trust serving about six counties, um, five of them in Oregon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rose Oheva, and I'm the Director of Manufactured Housing and Cooperative Development Center at CASA of Oregon. I'm Jeff Albanese from uh, Square One Villages. I'm the Program Director, and we're a nonprofit located in Eugene. Great, and um, we're all busy people, so we're just getting this together as we're going. Do you all, I think each of us have about 15 minutes on each of our topics, and then I guess what I wanted to get from you, do we wanna handle questions after each presentation or wait till the end? Okay, so we're gonna ask you to hold your questions till the end, so if you write them down, um, then we'll do kind of a group panel question and answer at the end, okay? All right, so um, we are gonna get started with the next slide, please. Um, all right, I already introduced myself, so that was easy. Uh, next slide. So Proud Ground, many of you are aware of Proud Ground, but we, um, over the last 21 years, have assisted over 600 families in purchasing their first home at an affordable price. Um, this has resulted actually in about 480 homes that are currently part of our permanently affordable community land trust program. Um, we are, I do always like to say, we are the largest community land trust in the Pacific Northwest, larger than Seattle, yay, um, and one of the largest in the country. Next slide, please. Um, the community land trust model itself is really designed for balance and inclusiveness. So this means both balancing the rights of the initial home uh, buyer to gain wealth and equity through their term of home, home ownership, while balancing that with the future home buyers' needs for an affordable opportunity. In the community land trust model, the core values center the community voices also in program design. So Proud Grounds bylaws basically require that one third of our board of directors be current Proud Ground homeowners. Um, thus giving them a place at the table to make key organizational decisions for, the, um, uh, for our nonprofit. In addition, all of Proud Ground homeowners are voting members of the organization. So we are a membership-based organization and those members get to vote on, on the key strategic goals that we have. They vote on who serves on our board of directors. Um, they also vote if we were ever to sell a piece of land out of our community land trust, we do need our member approval to do so. We also have strategic goals that include having at least 50% of our board of directors be from communities of color. And we are currently at about 67%, I think. Um, so this really does help center the community land trust model and balance the rights of the, the families we're serving. Uh, with the community as well as with the nonprofit. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a slide that talks about the model in general, but um, stepping way back, the community land trust model does, it really was born out of the civil rights movement um, when sharecroppers in Georgia were trying to get the right to vote, but they had to be landowners in order to do so. So they pooled their resources and collectively purchased a working farm. And in doing so, they created the first kind of model of a community land trust, basically holding land in trust for a community's needs. Since then, community land trusts have developed across the country and actually across the world. Um, and they are very diverse, but they have a similar model, holding land for community good. So in our model of homeownership, how we use the model at Proud Ground is for homeownership. 
So in this model, homeowners um, own, they basically own the land or own the structure on top of the land that is owned by Proud Ground and kept in our community land trust. Our homeowners enter into a 99 year land lease agreement. That lease agreement is renewable. So it's very protective for our homeowners. And basically what this agreement does is it allows or requires upon resale in the future, that home has to be sold to another low or moderate income family at an affordable price. So this kind of chart here is showing that Proud Ground is bringing in grant money to help buy down the cost of the home for that initial home buyer. So the first home buyer is getting a great deal. And then they are agreeing to the community land trust model to help make it affordable for future families. Next, next slide, please. So essentially the community land trust model allows that first home buyer to purchase the home at an affordable price. And then that buyer agrees that when they sell or if they sell, they are going to sell it to another income qualified family at an affordable price. And then the second buyer that buys that same home gets the home at a price they could afford and they agree to the same agreement. When they sell, they sell it to another income qualified family. So essentially that first, the grant money or the investment that's made for the first family to purchase that home stays in that home forever. And any additional, I mean, it, there's no future down payment needed to help the th second or third family. It's the um, CLT model that really does balance the rights of that first home buyer's investment in the home with the second buyer's opportunity to get the same option. So the model, um, it does work, not just in Portland in the metro region, but across the country and the world. Um, it really does allow communities to invest in permanently affordable home ownership opportunities that will impact generations. Um, the homes become affordable and more affordable is what we're seeing over time. So resale after resale, the affordability actually deepens so we, that we can serve lower and lower income households. Um, and it also is creating wealth. So in um, we've managed now over 120 resales of homes through our program. Um, over 60% of those families go on to buy a market rate home with the wealth that they've created through CLT ownership. And in fact, though, a lot of our families actually are looking at this as a very long-term purchase. So the families that have stayed in their homes for longer than 10 years, we estimate that currently they have about $107,000 in equity through both their increase in the share of appreciation they get, as well as just owning a home and paying a mortgage instead of paying rent. Next slide. All right, so there's these are about opportunities. So by making an investment in a specific home, um, not into an ad individual family, it allows your investment to impact multiple families over time. And like I said, grow over time. In addition, this model um, allows you to continue to provide access to housing and high opportunity or gentrifying neighborhoods. So as property values and the housing costs continue to climb, the cost of acquiring new homes or property in that area become completely unaffordable. But as a community land trust, if you were investing in that neighborhood early on, you know that once you invest in it the first time, that home will stay affordable in that neighborhood forever. And then you can obviously have broader impact through this. So you're not just creating one homeowner, but you are creating that one homeowner who will go on to make, uh, generate multiple opportunities for homeowners without any additional subsidy needed. Next slide, please. Okay, it's also a really flexible model. So community land trust can, can invest in communities in different ways. Um, we use down payment assistance awards to allow families to go out shopping on the open market and bring an existing home into our program. Um, that gives the family choice of where they buy, of what kind of house they want to purchase, and it allows us to have, um, uh, I would say, like sprinkle these permanently affordable homes within a mixed income neighborhood. 
You can also partner um, for new construction with either a nonprofit developer or for profit developer. Our history here in Portland was partnering with um, you know, several community development corporations that were doing uh, affordable or home ownership development at that time. Um, we also can do acquisition and rehab. So acquiring homes through different sources, whether it be donated homes um, or working with local housing authorities to um, bring homes into the program. Gosh, my notes aren't like, I, I wanna see the slide in front of me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and it does work in high density areas as well as in rural areas. So it really just depends on the, the model you wanna use. We can do a single family home, like I said, in an established neighborhood, or we've also done full condo developments where all of the homes are permanently affordable. Um, and that brings me to the whole like trick of community land trust. You actually don't have to own the land to do this. Um, so we also use for our condominiums, we actually use a deed restriction or affordable housing covenant to ensure the permanent affordability. So essentially, we're doing the same thing our community land trust land, land lease model of home ownership is doing. Um, we're basically stating that you got a great price and when you sell, you have to sell it to another income qualified family at a good price. Uh, next slide, please. And with these are just a little bit for people looking into this model. Um, there are lots of different funding sources that do allow um, to become the subsidy for that initial purchase. So we've looked, you know, we've used the tax uh, in the city of Portland tax increment financing in urban renewal districts to bring homes into the program. Um, there is also at the state level, the lift funds for home ownership uh, can be used to do community land trust. And we provide, uh, we're a provider of the OHCS down payment assistance as well. And then when you look at the federal level, which we were just talking about, um, we get funding through both the community development block program, the home, I don't remember what it's called, you know what it is, that program, home investment, something, something, um, and then I shop as well. So that's the self-help ownership program, something. Um, so all of those sources can be used for community land trust home ownership. Um, in addition to obviously private funding, uh, we have gotten, like I mentioned before, homes donated to our program. Uh, we get private foundational funding. We get, we've gotten other funding before. We've actually had um, great partnership with our local habitat, uh, Portland Metro Region, where we both are partnering with them to bring all of their homes into our community land trust. But also, as those homes that they developed over the years are reselling through their program, we've been able to actually bring some of those homes that are reselling into our community land trust to create the permanent affordability. Next slide. And then this is just a uh, little scenario of what this might look like. Um, every time I do this slide, I have to up these numbers. <laughs> I think before it was like 350 and even now I'm like, okay, where's the $450,000 house? But let's just say the $450,000 house is out there Proud Ground is bringing in $150,000, our family, and that's from either public, uh, usually a combination, sometimes five or six layers deep of public and private funding. And then our homeowner themselves is getting a mortgage for the $300,000 to be able to afford the home. And one of the cool things I'll leave you with here is through the lending guidelines for community land trusts, they can count all of our down payment as the home buyer's down payment. So our home buyers avoid private mortgage insurance. They avoid the down payment requirements. They usually, they don't have to do like an FHA loan. They usually do a conventional loan. So there's a lot of additional savings involved as well. And thankfully in the state of Oregon, um, in the last year, we're just over the first year of this coming into play, um, all of the land that's owned by organizations like ours across the state is tax exempt. So our homeowners actually get reduced property taxes as well. So that's just a little bit about our program. Um, I didn't really talk about who our homeowners are, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Rose. Great, thanks Katie. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Next slide. Sorry. Yeah, I think I talked about it. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, Keep going. I'm sorry. I know it's pretty massive. There's resources. I can tell you fast. I will Yeah, we'll share the PowerPoints. Oh, thank you. One more. Aw, nice photo of the family. Yeah, for Casa. Yeah, we want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A. Well, while we're waiting, again, my name is Rose O'Hevan. I'm the director of our Manufactured Housing and Cooperative Development Center at uh, CASA of Oregon. And um, I'm going to speak to you about resident-owned communities. And I do want to put a plug in for Thursday at 1030. Uh, you'll be able to actually hear from residents about that organizing experience. So if you want to learn more about this uh, effort uh, from their perspective, I definitely encourage you to attend that session. So again, uh, I'm with Casa of Oregon, and we are uh, part of a network uh, affiliated with Rock USA. Rock USA is our national partner based out of New Hampshire, and they first started this program uh, to help residents purchase their manufactured housing communities in the early 80s. Next slide. We are a nonprofit organization uh, operating statewide. And we first started by developing uh, farm worker housing throughout the state in response to the uh, migrant housing crisis that we were experiencing or have been experiencing for decades. So that was our initial call to action was farm worker housing. And since that time, we've expanded to develop other forms of uh, multifamily housing, community facilities, uh, family economic opportunity programs through IDAs, and then of course, our resident owned community program. Next slide. And as I mentioned, these are our major programs, real estate development, uh, asset building, resident communities, and we also have a, a CDFI. Uh, we have a community loan fund that provides uh, loans uh, primarily to the projects that we get involved uh, with. Uh, we offer uh, pre-development loans, construction loans, and uh, also permanent uh, loans, uh, usually as a secondary financing source. Next slide. So again, we are part of a, a, a national organization, Rock USA, and we have nine affiliates so far throughout the um, state, uh, throughout the country. Uh, and for our areas, we operate uh, in the Northwest in uh, Washington State, Montana, Oregon, and Idaho. So we there are CTAPs located throughout the Pacific Northwest, and we are a very collaborative group of folks. So we meet very regularly to just sort of uh, keep in touch with how our program is going and offer assistance where we can to each other. So what we do, we help residents buy their parks. And we, uh, as part of that process, we uh, meet with the residents, explain how the program works, and then um, we, uh, review with them a preliminary financial performa and uh, get their advice on whether to proceed with a purchase or not. They generally are responsible for getting in touch with all the residents to make sure that we have at least a decent majority of residents who want to move forward with the park purchase. And as part of this process, we organize and train the residents. Uh, we have uh, technical assistance managers who provide that training. We have project managers also who uh, help during this initial pre-purchase process. Uh, we coordinate the infrastructure improvements, um, both during the uh, inspection process and then post um, the purchase. And then again, we provide ongoing technical support to help them with their operations of these uh, communities. So we're essentially business advisors to these cooperatives and we help them with their governance and um, uh, capital improvement planning, uh, sometimes mediation, <laughs> depending on what's needed in the community and then connecting them to resources. Next page. So we uh, work, um, actually, let me skip this one because I kind of reviewed this. Let's go on to the next. Uh, I, I do want to spend some time talking about the opportunity to purchase law in the state of Oregon. This was initially passed in 2014 and amended in uh, 2021 to uh, allow residents more time in which to respond to the, uh, uh, to the owner uh, if they decide they want to move forward with the purchase of a park. So basically in Oregon, owners who decide, park owners who decide they wanna sell their parks, 
even if one even want to just consider selling it, uh, have to give notice to the residents that they are intending to sell their part. And then that basically starts the clock. They send a written notice to the residents. They send a notice to the state of Oregon, Oregon Housing and Community Services, their manufactured housing resource section. And then uh, residents have to kind of on their own figure out where to go to for support. And usually they get word that CASA of Oregon is available to help them. There are some private uh, uh, consultants out there who also can help residents uh, form cooperatives and purchase their park, uh, but they're not affiliated with Rock USA. We offer, uh, I think, a lot more in terms of uh, services and especially post-purchase. So the residents get the notice, they find us, uh, we issue, we help them issue a notice of intent to compete to purchase. And then we issue that to the owner. Uh, CASA is basically acting on behalf is kind of the proxy for the residents um, based on their um, basic guidance to us to move forward. And then we issue a confidentiality notice to the uh, seller of the park, and then they provide the statute required uh, documentation that's uh, required as part of our analysis of, their, of this park purchase. We um, uh, come up with a preliminary financial feasibility. We share that information with the residents. They, um, and again, this is a resident leader group. Not, we don't necessarily share it with all the residents, but we share it with the resident leader group. And then if necessary, we can share it with all the residents, depending on the advice of the resident committee. Um, and then we continue to uh, move forward uh, with their advice on whether to proceed with the purchase of the park. And the residents get about 45 days after they get the financial information from the seller in which to make the decision to move forward. So I'm, I'm really condensing this process significantly. There's an awful lot at play in this process and there's a lot of communication between uh, the CASA staff and the residents as we're moving forward. Uh, we might have a few meetings with them too, depending again on the needs of the group. Some committee, uh, resident committees are, are, have already been previously organized and they're really eager to move forward and are really effective at, uh, at communicating with the residents. Others are less so. And so they may need more meetings uh, to meet with all the residents. Next slide. So this is just a um, kind of a really general overview of how the uh, acquisition process works. I, I think I've covered some of these, but you'll, you'll see here that we generally need, or we ask for about six months in which to move forward with a purchase of a park uh, so that we try to negotiate that upfront with the seller of the park. Uh, right now, given the market the way it is for uh, manufactured dwelling parks, it's, it's still really active. It's slowed down a bit, but it still remains active. And uh, manufactured dwelling parks are a real hot commodity right now for real estate investors. Uh, because we're they're you know they're dealing with folks who are kind of frankly stuck in their housing. They own their homes and they're in a manufactured dwelling park, and so they you know they feel kind of stuck in that. And and the homeowner or the excuse me, the park owners know this, and it's also they're just uh, basically maintaining the infrastructure of the park. The individual homeowners are responsible for their own homes, so it can be a real uh, you know. Uh, really lucrative cash investment for the real estate investor. So we try to negotiate this. We're not always successful, especially lately. Uh, we're often having to close really quickly and more often than not, we're, we're being forced to close within 120 days, which means that we have to bring in a bridge financing uh, to purchase the park and then convert later to permanent financing. And that's extremely expensive. And we try to avoid it when we can, but uh, more often than not, we're often having to do bridge financing first and then converting it to a perm loan. And again, we'll share these PowerPoint presentations so you can kind of get an overview of how this process works. Next page. Uh, let's see, uh, there is there are non-co-ops. I left this in here. This was actually a, a, a slide we prepared for another presentation we're going to be holding with um, Network for Oregon Affordable Housing. And this is a process for, uh, for no, I, I think it should be more uh, for those that are, that are required with, by nonprofits. Nonprofits can also purchase parks. And so we do have um, a couple of um, nonprofits that have entered or that are from Oregon and have entered the Oregon market to purchase parks uh, and they operate them as nonprofits. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I talked about the technical assistance that's available to the residents post-purchase, 
And uh, I thought an iceberg was a really good representation of just kind of what we provide in terms of, you know, what we see sort of uh, above the iceberg in terms of the direct services that we provide to the uh, resident community once they purchase their park. So we assist them with their board governance. We help them with the operation support. We help them with business advising and planning. And then we also help them with their budget preparation and again, their capital improvement planning. And then all the things we do sort of below the surface are um, assisting. We do have an asset manager uh, full-time who analyzes all of the co-ops, uh, make sure that they are uh, you know, meeting all the timeframes that they need to meet, uh, the budget preparation, um, Lenders require CPA compiled financials. Uh, there's compliance review. Um, we do get our funding from the state of Oregon. And of course, those funding resources come with covenants and uh, income restrictions. So we have to make sure that they're in compliance with those income restrictions. We assist with some loan servicing and we do uh, sort of act as a liaison with the property management company as well. And then in terms of uh, the directorship, we are heavily involved with the advocacy uh, to uh, provide additional funding for park preservation. And one big area of need is manufactured home loan replacement. So we're always advocating for those funding sources. Uh, we do offer additional training support uh, through our partnership with Rock USA. Uh, we have a, um, a low cost uh, a law firm uh, through the um, Lewis and Clark College, the Small Business Legal Clinic, uh, they're providing a lot of assistance to both Casa of Oregon's program and then also directly to the cooperatives. And then again, uh, we do have um, bilingual uh, technical assistance managers as well as bilingual uh, resources, translators, interpreters who assist us pretty heavily these days with a lot of our park purchases. And then again, we have our national partner who provides a lot of uh, staff training and a lot of board training, mostly online right now, uh, and then do provide, um, or at least they used to, and we're hoping they return to this, provide a national conference for all the residents. We also do have uh, a rock association, and this is a, a national group that's comprised of residents of our uh, co-ops who get together and meet regularly to just talk about rock issues and needs and wants essentially as well. And let's see. And then again, we just continue to provide ongoing support. Uh, we um, we do have uh, contracts that we execute with the co-ops, and uh, we're required to provide this uh, technical assistance for at least 10 years. Uh, they can fire us if they want to. Um, most of them keep us on. And um, some, well, let's say we started our first co-ops in 2008, and we're still providing technical assistance support. Um, but if they needed to, um, the, the financing does require ongoing technical assistance. So um, they do have to have, have at least some uh, advising available to them if it's not gonna be CASA of Oregon. And next slide, I think that might be, uh, yeah, this is just kind of a summary of how many parks we've preserved. Um, nationally, I believe there's over 900 parks that have been preserved by through all of the CTAPs in the US. Uh, so far, we've preserved 25 parks with about 20, 1,700 home sites. Uh, we're, we're on the verge right now of closing on our 26th park, and we try to average two or three parks a year. Uh, most of the parks that we look at it, through the um, uh, notices that we received and tend to compete uh, don't make it, uh, either because the residents decide they're not ready to move forward with a park purchase, or there's some issue with the park. Uh, or we can't always find the financing, the capital financing uh, or the gap funding that we need to make these deals happen. The timing sometimes can just really be off. So if the timing works, we can move forward with the park purchase. And that means you know two or three parks a year. We're hoping in the near future that we get to have an opportunity to develop a new park as well. And next page, I don't know if there's one more. Oh, and this is a photo of all the residents who uh, from Horizon, that was our very first park that we uh, started to develop in 2008 and completed in 2009. It was a completely redeveloped park. That's why you see vacant um, lots there. And uh, next page, I can't remember if there's another slide or not, or is that it? Is that the last? Okay, great, then I am done. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, 
So my name is Jeff Albanese. I'm the Director of Community and Program Development with Square One Villages. We're located in Eugene. Um, and we were founded in 2012, actually, as an alternative shelter provider using um, tiny houses for adults experiencing homelessness. And it grew out of some grassroots organizing in Eugene um, that, that grew out of the local Occupy protests. And during the first year of that project, um, which was intended to be a self-managed uh, community for, for people who needed uh, shelter, we quickly realized that um, there really wasn't any realistic housing for the people we were serving at our first project. Um, and so we decided to see if we could figure out how to develop housing um, again, as like non-experts. Um, and so that's really what we've turned our attention to um, is developing affordable housing and specifically uh, using a shared equity model that combines elements of a community land trust and a housing cooperative. So, so we've got four co-op projects currently. Uh, our first was Emerald Village, which is located in Eugene and is 22 units um, using detached, small, tiny houses. And um, that was opened in 2018. Our second project is called Cottage Village Cooperative. And that's located in a small town about a half hour um, south of Eugene called Cottage Grove. And that's 13 units, uh, very similar otherwise to Emerald Village. Our third project is located in Springfield and was an infill project of six one bedroom um, flats using like a house and a, an ADU. And our current project, which we're in the midst of um, filling right now, which is kind of one of the reasons that I don't have any slides, is. Uh, 70 unit project called the Peace Village Cooperative, which is going to be located in Eugene and will most likely have the first residents moving in in uh, December of this year. So why would one want to combine a housing cooperative and a community land trust? Uh, first of all, for many of the same reasons that um, Katie and Rose described for why Proudground and, and CASA are already doing similar things. One is subsidy retention and preservation um, using a community land trust model, um, long-term stewardship and balancing stakeholders over a long time scale, including like future people who need affordable housing. Uh, the, the, Big ones really for us in addition to that are owner occupancy and resident control um, of their housing and how it's managed and how much it, it costs and how much they're charged. Although we're unlike Proud Ground, we're, we're less focused on wealth building for our households and I'll get to that um, shortly. Another reason for um, utilizing cooperative housing is cooperatives allow for the co-op to hold a mortgage loan. And so that makes um, owner occupancy accessible to more households that otherwise wouldn't be able to qualify for a mortgage individually. And then uh, specifically for this community land trust and co-op like combination, this was a model that was really developed to ensure permanent affordability and, and ultimately to prevent um, cooperatives from converting to market rate, which has been a problem in places that have seen uh, housing market recovery after like a lot of public support for co-op conversions um, for like affordability reasons. And that that's achieved by um, similar to what uh, to what Proud Ground is doing, that's achieved through a ground lease between a community land trust and a cooperative that gives the community land trust community land trust certain rights um, before a cooperative can like change its bylaws and and do something like convert to market rate. So, how are we doing? 
how are we doing this? How are we developing uh, this model and, and how are we pursuing this strategy for permanent affordability? Um, as this as the community land trust, um, Square One uh, serves as a steward for affordability on the land that we own um, that is achieved similar to what program does, which is a third of our board is composed of current leaseholders, like residents on land that uh, Square One Villages owns. And our bylaws uh, have restrictions on what Square One can do with land that it owns, um, requires like certain consent from existing leaseholders before Square One could ever like sell or encumber any land um, that, that people are living on. And um, and then establishes an ongoing long-term ground lease relationship between Square One and and the residents, which in our case, our our relationship is more with cooperatives rather than individual households. Um, and the long-term support that we provide to the co-ops are technical assistance, similar to what um, Casa is doing training and support to the members of co-ops on like board governance and budgeting and stuff like that. And then also we are increasingly involved in advocacy and policy stuff related um, mostly to um, co-op housing. So the co-ops we develop, um, so, so we're developing multifamily projects that are organized as housing cooperatives where the housing is owned and or controlled by a cooperative corporation whose members have equal say in the management of that housing. Each member also has occupancy rights to one of the units that the co-op owns or controls. <clears throat> the purpose of the cooperative is not for profit, although it's not a 501c3, and it's it's intended to meet a common need of all its members for affordable housing. So it's not exactly like a intentional community necessarily. It's it's pooling resources to meet a common economic need. Um, the co-ops members elect and form a board and committees to manage the property themselves, and important most importantly, they set their own budget and therefore like what everybody's monthly charges are. The co-op is operating at cost, so there's not a landlord um, with a profit margin that needs to be built in. Um, we also think that it encourages better attention among the residents to ongoing upkeep because they know that it's in their financial interest to take care of things sooner rather than later. And then it offers security of tenure. Nobody, um, nobody living in this co-op is subject to the really crazy rent hikes that a lot of people in the rental market um, are facing. Um, so of those four projects, we've we've organized two broadly different types of cooperatives. Um, limited equity cooperatives, and then no equity or leasehold co-ops, and which type, um, we've used has really been has been determined by a few different things like our ultimate goals like what level of income are we targeting um but really it's been about the types of subsidies that have been available for these kind of projects and this can be a challenge this is like a main challenge for developing co-ops because current like existing policy really presupposes that housing is either investor owned rental or um, a single family home ownership, like fee simple single family home ownership. Um, so we've done two no equity or leasehold co-ops. Uh, those are our first two projects and they target, the, the income limit is 50% of the area median income, but most of the people living there are probably between 30 and 40% of the area median income. Um, and so a, a no equity or leasehold co-op is where the cooperative does not own um, any physical assets. Instead, they hold a long-term master lease with square one. In turn, each member of the cooperative has a proprietary lease, which is like an occupancy agreement with the cooperative. There's, uh, there's no upfront 
investment cost for members that, you know, people pay like a security deposit, but um, they don't need to um, purchase any anything beyond that. And because of all of this, because the, the co-op doesn't own any physical assets, they largely like aren't able to get their own financing because they don't have any collateral. Um, and so we've, that's where Square One has stepped in to acquire financing if it's been needed. Although for unusual reasons, Emerald Village and Cottage Village um, have were largely developed like without any debt, just through fundraising. At Emerald Village and Cottage Village, the goal, the number one goal was deep affordability. Um, like I said, they were they were developed virtually debt free with private fundraising that um, Square One did through fundraisers and um, and also like some foundation grants. But they also needed to take advantage of a few different subsidies that um, are really geared more towards rentals. So those were system development charge waivers and um, the low income rental housing property tax exemption, which are both things done by the city and, and Eugene, both of those are available. Um, the way they're structured, they kind of require um, square one to be an owner um, for, for different like technical reasons. Um, and then Cottage Village received a county a grant from Lane County for a half million dollars that was also uh, structured as a forgivable loan, which requires one owner. So hence the no equity or leasehold co-op model. Our two limited equity projects are C Street in Springfield and the Peace Village project, the one that's going to be opening soon. Um, in these projects, the cooperative owns the buildings and improvements, and Square One and Square One owns the land and has a ground lease. So, separating those two things, like Proud Ground uh, is doing to preserve affordability, members purchase a share um, for five thousand dollars each household, and the money raised through that share purchase is the co-op's equity in the project. So, for for Peace Village, that's um, about three hundred or is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The remainder of the debt is held by the cooperative. So the cooperative will have a, a mortgage loan and be responsible for making those payments in addition to covering all its maintenance reserves, um, taxes, insurance costs. Um, and uh, for, for that project also their utilities. Um, just a little bit more about how both of these projects were developed. So C Street was a six unit infill project. Um, the income limit for people living there is 80% of the area median income. Uh, Square One did again, like a bunch of fundraising um, to subsidize it. There was a local like social investor who was okay with like not as big a profit margin as he probably could have otherwise got. Um, we received $10,000 per household in CDBG down payment assistance through the city of Springfield. Um, they were able to, to do that um, for this project. Uh, and like we kind of worked with them on explaining how the model worked. And the remainder was through share purchases by each household at $10,000 each. Um, and then that project also receives a tax break on the land value because there's a 99 year ground lease, um, like a 99 year affordability covenant, like uh, Proud Grounds houses. The Peace Village project, the 70 unit project, uh, the income limits for that are 60% of area median income. The total project costs about $11 million in total to develop. Money for that was from a uh, unusual OHCS subsidy that was like related to um, like ARPA federal money. Um, the city of Eugene's affordable housing trust fund also provided uh, development funding. Um, and then Square One did a significant amount of private fundraising. The remaining um, the remaining two million gap is covered by a construction loan, which will ultimately be 
um, what the co-op converts into permanent financing once it's uh, been leased up for a few months. And then the, the last remaining bit, the equity that the co-op is uh, providing is coming through a $5,000 share purchase by each household. Um, so yeah, that was a lot of information, but that's kind of what we're doing. Do we have another, oh, oh, yay. Do we have another mic? Like if we wanted to do questions so that we can, okay. Sure. Can I just, so they can also speak on the mic? Okay. Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll share, we'll share this mic. Okay. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, hi, your face. So this question's for you. So does Proud Brown have developed, um, programs are working with in rural parts of Oregon? And if so, where at? Great question. So um, we, uh, let me think here. Uh, we, uh, there used to be a community land trust in Lincoln County that served Lincoln County and they were a very small organization with two homes and they um, were unable to sustain themselves. And so we worked with them for about two years with their board and in the end ended up taking over that service area and the homes in their portfolio. And thankfully we were able to add 12 more homes. So we now do serve Lincoln County. Um, and then we are working and partnering with a builder in Medford and um, doing 80 to 87, depends on the day, <laughs> of, uh, of homes that are focused on fire survivors from the, the 2020 wildfires. So those are the two areas. We have lots of conversations all the time with different areas in Oregon that are interested in starting community land trusts, and um, we're happy to talk with the communities. Um, it really just depends on the community support and what's happening there, whether they're doing their own. I know there is, I don't know if Doug's here, but there is um, the Hood River area is working on a community land trust as well. I'm gonna go there and then, oops, scary cat. Um. My question is, you know, for the past 30 years, the state of Oregon has enjoyed basically a growing real estate market. And do, you know, what are the safeguards in place for when and, well, if and when the market does tank? Uh -oh. I, Who is that? I, I think it's just a general question. I mean, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I have an answer for that, correct? Huh? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the it will not be allowed to tank essentially um, because it's so critical to the financial system. Um, I don't think that there, I don't think that that is super likely like a major, major correction the way that there was like in 2008, I guess is, which is not great for affordability purposes and ultimately. Well, I guess for our rocks, um, I refer to them as Great Recession and Pandemic Proof. Um, they um, sailed through, you know, both periods uh, extremely well. Uh, we, you know, the lender really sets them up really well with reserves at the very beginning as part of their financing. And then uh, the residents, because they're controlling their own costs, essentially, uh, do a superior job. I mean, they know exactly how the the operating costs are going to impact their rents. So they do an outstanding job of managing that. And then because we connect them to resources, if any of the residents ever do fall behind, you know, we're uh, helping the their board find the resources to help the residents. So um, I would say our, our resident communities have have done extremely well through those really hard economic times. For the individual homeowners, Katie, have you ever, you know, seen something where somebody's gotten underwater, perhaps on their on their housing? Good question. Um, so how I like to describe the community land trust model is we're taking homes off the speculative market and creating our own little controlled market. Um, so I do feel like our homeowners are protected and the community's investment is protected more so than it would be in the open market. Um, what we, our homeowners though, with our resale formula, they are subject to the market. 
So back in 2009 or during the, the recession, um, we had homeowners that wanted to sell their community land trust homes and there was a dip in market value and our homeowners get a share of that dip. They don't take the full dip, which is great, um, but they were deciding just like their market rate neighbor that now was not the time to sell because they either weren't gonna have enough equity or they might not be able to pay off their loan. So we definitely have just like a market rate homeowner, but I think what I've experienced is our homeowners are definitely protected and insulated more than a market rate homeowner would be. In the cases of like Square One or other organizations where somebody other than the co-op owns the land or significant assets, can that organization or does that organization take use the land or assets as collateral or as part of the agreement with the co-op that they cannot use the assets or land as collateral? Yeah, so so in our case, the that's like allow we we allow the whatever mortgage the co-op is getting to um put the land up as collateral. It's it's like expected by the bank and stuff. Hi, Katie. Um, so my question is on the program land trust properties, how is the resale market set? Um to ensure that it is serving the moderate to low income households. Uh, so community land trust cross country use a resale formula basically to determine that, that price um, at resale, which is again, trying to balance the wealth creation from the initial family with the new buyer's affordability. So there's like three different models or formulas used across the country. Um, we use a, a pre, uh, appraisal based formula. So we actually allow our homeowners to take 25% of the change in market value. So and that's increase or decrease. Um, so they, they get a share of that plus what they paid. They get back everything they paid for the property plus that, that share. Um, and then other CLTs use like a fixed rate formula. So their homeowners get one and a half, two percent every year return. Now in all those formulas, when you're talking about the market, um, there is a catch there that if the property value, the land and the house together are appraising at less than this formula price, it's the lesser of the two. So we do educate our homeowners that even, you know, market rate homeownership or CLT homeownership, it's a risk. Um, and they... Objectively, what, do we had uh, over a 19% equity increase in the last three years. So they're not subject to that, that market. Uh, so they would, you know, 25% of 19%, right? So they get a share of that. So it is, we, and we have stuck with an appraisal based formula for the whole 20 some odd years we've been doing this. And it is because we do want our homeowners to, you know, when the markets are hot, they're also getting a bigger return. That next buyer, can, you know, that, that sales price is going to be a little bit lower than that 19% increase anyway, so that they can qualify. Exactly. Right. I was kind of curious about the, um, uh, basically the models that include like uh, an income restriction where, you know, um, a member, you know, puts down this down payment to purchase the membership, but it also has a, the income restriction. If they exceed that income restriction in the future, um, do they kind of stay in that home and what happens, you know, to their, initial investment in that membership. Well, uh, yeah, we, with our program, if it uh, receives public funding through Oregon Housing Community Services, and we use both Oregon Affordable Housing Tax Credits and GAP funds, um, there is an income restriction. Uh, the restriction is that at least 60% of the residents have to have incomes below 80% AMI. So they do have at least 40% of the residents um, who can exceed that income level. Um, so they have to annual, uh, you know, analyze that every year to make sure that they're in compliance. Um, but when we do the initial income surveys of all the residents, they tend to fall in about the 70% um, uh, of 80% AMI. So there is a cushion there. And of course, this is naturally occurring affordable housing, manufactured dwelling parks. So the incomes generally are lower income below 80%, but they do allow for some to exceed that level. 
and yeah, are, are, ours are similar um, that there is like a income restriction for uh, incoming members and but it's a similar situation where the maximum allowed uh, area median income for like the C Street project is uh, 80%. Most of the people living there are probably closer to 60% anyway. And then we suspect it'll be a similar thing with the Peace Project where the income restriction will be 60% AMI and it'll probably be like 50 or lower AMI people actually living there. And with our program, we just certify at purchase. Other questions? Anyone? Oh, there we go. I was wondering if all of you can talk about what your advocacy priorities are, um, both for your own programs and for scaling up uh, land trusts and co-ops in our state. Well, of course, um, we need more loan capital, uh, which is going to become problematic, I think, for 2024 um, for both bridge and permanent financing. So we're going to be, uh, you know, looking for those resources um, and certainly, you know, grant funding to help subsidize the purchase of these very, what is getting to be very expensive manufactured dwelling parks. Uh, we want to make sure that we are we have a lift program that is going to be um, you know uh, you know well designed and developed for potentially new manufactured dwelling parks. So we're looking at that as well, and uh, and then we also are uh, <clears throat> working to create more uh, funding for replacement of manufactured uh, dwellings. And we definitely want to support more uh, manufacturing of affordable. Um, manufactured structures. So we have a couple of nonprofits that are emerging to do that to work. Um, so we're you know, just continuing to do that. And then for us, it's zoning, rezoning. Um, we really need to encourage cities to rezone to allow um, the development of new manufactured dwelling parks. Um, for us, we actually had worked on two bills the last legislature that did end up passing. Um, one was a change to the um, low income rental housing property tax exemption program to like allow limited equity cooperatives to benefit from that, which is a huge um, boost. And previously it was only possible for rental projects. And then we also, there was like a small change to do a similar thing for the Oregon affordable housing tax credits to like just allow those to be used for a limited equity housing cooperative. Um, Another bill that we had was a similar um, opportunity to purchase bill that really didn't get very far, but for existing built like apartment buildings rather than parks, which we'd like to see. And then I guess the other big thing in uh, in Oregon right now is just the way that the maximum amount you can get for lift home ownership is like makes things hard for um, for new multifamily development, which is. Um, which is one of the reasons that we have done these like leasehold co-ops because if all that's available is lifts rental um, equity, um, that that creates challenges for us. Uh, we also supported like a, a public bank study bill in Oregon um, because financing is the other big thing for us. And like the secondary market isn't, does not serve uh, cooperatives well, which makes just finding mortgages hard. And I can just speak from, uh, I'm not on the advocacy side myself, so this is going to be uh, kind of basic, I guess, but it's, you know, obviously more funding for home ownership um, and home preservation. I think we, as our homeowners are staying longer and longer in their homes, especially shared equity homeowners, um, really looking at a source of funding to help them maintain and repair their homes. Um, and then I just wanted to put out there what I'm really excited about is um, this initiative that came out of the racial disparities group looking at um, mortgages for shared equity homeowners and trying to get subsidy to buy down the rates. I'm gonna get this totally wrong probably, but um, buy down the rates for shared equity homeowners. So they're able to actually potentially buy into a 15 year mortgage rather than a 30 year. So they can actually gain uh, wealth and equity quicker than a market rate homeowner. And that balances out the fact that they're, they're passing, they're agreeing to pass on some of their you know, 
equity and share to another homeowner to make it affordable. So that's something I'm really excited about. I don't even know what time it is, so. We have, uh, we have 10 3 okay. Time. We do, I mean, we do have 12 more minutes. Did I do that right? We don't have to stay here for 12 minutes, for sure. Um, but if folks have questions, now's your shot. Thank you. Um, can you talk about your relationship with banks? So like proud ground home buyers can go out on the private market and choose a home, but you're facilitating an affordable mortgage. And I assume that you are working with lenders as well. Like, um, can you just explain kind of how, how banks partner? I can start and then if you want to go. Yeah, uh, well, we have some banking partners in the room today. Very exciting. Um, so yeah, proud. the nice thing about Community Land Trust is uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Oregon Bond, they all recognize and have lending guidelines for Community Land Trust programs. Um, so really, it's just as easy as saying to the lender, like, do you sell to Fannie Mae? Yeah, okay, well, you could do this. Um, but then it gets more complicated because it's a little bit more unique. Um, they did do some work in the last two years nationally um, under what's called duty to serve, um, which has made it actually easier for community land trusts to be able to show like, hey, we are a community land trust that is approved. So the lender has more security in knowing that our program meets the qualifications for the selling guidelines for Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac and so on. Um, so we do a lot of work though with our lending partners and we do um, have a preferred lender list because it's not just about being able to do the loans, it's being able to understand how to set it up on their end um, so that it's, you know, coming out the backside correctly, I would say. Seamless, yes. Um, so there's a lot of work done on that, but we do have a lot of different funding, um, lending options. The one area that community land trusts need more support in is um, like home equity loans. So, so that is a challenge for our homeowners, which is another reason why I put out their advocacy re regarding home repair and preservation. Um, they, in the lending world, they view our land lease as a lien, and then they have their first mortgage and their HELOC would be in third and they don't like that. So at this point in time, we actually can only do HELOCs with one bank, which is Banner Bank. And they did it as a portfolio special product for our, our homeowners. What about lending with co-ops? Yeah, uh, it's definitely a challenge and it's required a lot of time kind of like educating uh, banking partners on how the co-op land trust thing like works and getting them comfortable. One thing that was helpful for us is um, I, we're only, I'm only aware, although I think there may be more now, of one other community land trust that exclusively develops co-op housing. And that's the Lopez Island Community Land Trust in Washington. And they had worked with um, a local bank there called Islanders Bank. And they it, it was helpful to put um, like the bank that we were talking to, Summit, in, in touch with people from, from there to so that it could get explained to them. Uh, the, the loan that we got for C Street was a portfolio loan, so it was unusual. Um, unfortunately, the secondary market, um, yeah, I have heard that the secondary market is becoming better for single family homes that are on community land trust land, but not for co-ops. There is a federal like mortgage insurance program for just cooperative housing in general, whether or not it's on a CLT. And it's just, there's not a lot of, um, lenders that use it and it's complicated and kind of expensive. So it's been one-on-one -on -one with like a local with Summit Bank, which is who we've worked with mostly at this point. And for us, we, I mean, we, we definitely educate uh, lenders about this model and, but more often than not, they are providing uh, partner loans to network for Oregon affordable housing, who actually does the, the financing. So it's not unusual to see um, you know, maybe three or four different lenders um, providing participation loans to Network for Oregon Affordable Housing, who ultimately makes the loan for our co-ops. Um, but it does require a lot of educating, a lot of reinsurance that this rock model works. Uh, we have a proven track record. I don't think we've had any defaults of any rocks nationally. 
Um, and, um, you know, it's a real testament to the ability of the residents to be able to manage um, their resident owned community. Is it true that a client or a buyer can identify a property that's not in your portfolio and bring it to you and turn it into a portable? Can you explain that, how that works? Yeah, um, so you we call, we call it the buyer-driven model, um, but it's basically we you know approve the buyer, they're eligible, then they get you know, a reservation of funds um, or a down payment assistance award, I guess you could call it. And then they go out shopping with their mortgage plus our down, down payment assistance on the open market and find a home that's eligible. There's all kinds of criteria. Um, and if they get under contract, then yeah, they can bring an existing home with a market rate seller into the program at that time. Um, what are the um, sort of models for transferring um, for transferability of a unit within, you know, to a family member or um, as a legacy um, inheritance? And how does that work? For, for us in the bylaws that um, we create for the cooperative is, and also in the ground lease, like the one exception to where a transfer does not have to um, be to an income qualifying person if it's is if it's a person's uh heir like a family member um that's kind of the one route where um like the co-ops board doesn't have to approve somebody and the the person living in the unit doesn't have to income qualify when they move in yeah that's true for the rock model as well um it's becoming quite common that they, you know, as um, some members um, sort of age out, that they will make arrangements to transfer the unit to the um, a, a, an heir um, by putting them on title. We're seeing that a lot more and more, um, and um, it works well. Uh, they still have to be, if they're not living in the unit, they do have to be approved as a, as a member. I'll also just say like on that, like for us, like wealth building really is not like what the purpose is. Um, so home ownership for our folks kind of means something different and is more about security of tenure and the inheritability of like their occupancy rights is like a big thing for a lot of the folks that we work with um, as like a major benefit of doing it this way. Um, but it does, you know, it also requires owner occupancy. So I talked to my families about, you want to leave it to your kids 20 years from now, that's great. But now they own their own houses and their only option at that point would be to either move into the proud ground home or sell it and they could get the wealth to another income qualified family and they could get the wealth created from mm -hmm. their family's ownership. Right. I, I wanted to just let, to clarify one thing, uh, the members in our rocks receive 50 year lease agreements and renewable at the end of 15 years for 99 years. So, I mean, this is uh, the golden ticket in my opinion. With interest rates where they are now for mortgages, are owners able to potentially refinance down the road if and when rates come back down? For us, yes. For refinance, I think the question is about refinancing when interest rates go down. So for, for our projects, like the the share loan, I guess, is another area where there's not necessarily ready financing existing um, because cooperative housing is not as common around here uh, the way that it is like in uh, the New York City area or something. What we've done is created our own like revolving loan fund basically to help uh, to help initial members like purchase a, a share, which again is like between five and $10,000 um, at this point. 
So nobody, nobody would be like refinancing that, I guess, um, cause it's not as much of an individual thing. The, I think the co-ops will have a challenge, um, refinancing anything just because it's good. It's that's a area that is a challenge for the co-ops to do anyway is secure good permanent financing. We had some very early co-ops that had some high interest rate loans, and these were some of these were privately developed co-ops. And then we had one that high that was uh, developed with no grant subsidy, and unfortunately, uh, you know, we didn't have Oregon Affordable Housing tax credits available at that time. So they are refinancing with, or actually, both of them are refinancing with Oregon Affordable Housing tax credits. I guess that's. All right. With that, I think we're going to wrap her up. So thank you all thank so you. much and thank you. <laughs> whatever that is whatever you want it to do but congratulations i'm glad you did that is diane off in bahamas well yes <laughs> Effectively, it's where we we'll start playing the property one day. That could be a little bit. Okay. She's going to do a little bit of that. Right. And then, then off they go. Okay. We just need to get a check in. Let's kind of understand the project. Let's do that. Um, Mid October, kind of all over the place until then, but I'll remember to reach out to you and, and, and just touch base. Yep, I, we're still going. We're still, I mean, people still keep dropping in. It's, it's ebb and flow. It's slower than I'd ever expected. I haven't jumped off the St. John's Bridge yet. So that is good. Um, right? <laughs> They're still going. All right, I'll call I'll mid October. Nice to see you soon. Jesus. You know, it's like funny. Do I have one? Uh, and I was gonna. I was at the fundraising breakfast this morning, and I was like, you know, they're always like your business card in the fee through the raffle, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, mine are in my car. Well, I can take a picture of it if you don't yeah, want. to. No, it's it, we're, we're actually. Yeah. I actually looked into Proud Ground because I actually saw we were looking um, on Zillow, and I'm like, Proud Ground, what is Proud Ground? And I looked at it, and I'm like, I didn't even know this was a thing. Okay, cool. Uh, then I um, but I actually, um, so I work for Fair Housing Council, uh, and one of my service areas, yeah, Lincoln yeah. County. Uh, yeah, so I actually wanted to reach out regarding so, Lincoln um, County because that was I also something that one of the things that's on our mind is how do we acquire I really additional love land to uh, expand to grow our programming? Because I'd really, because really like them to try and yeah. push them to join. Yeah. You know, yeah. That did not have oh my gosh, it's probably over. Oh, yeah, I wasn't going to know, but it was like, there was a little bit of a. Well, it is very reactive, conservative to yeah. Portland, so. No, I know. I <laughs>